Hi there, I'm Jason Ross, and I'm very happy to be interviewing William Binney, a former senior NSA official. Mr. Binney served in the NSA for over 30 years, including as technical director of its World Geopolitical and Military Analysis Reporting Group. He worked on developing many of the technologies still used by the NSA, and he resigned in 2001 over the potential for a totalitarian, as he put it, Orwellian state in which the technical means to spy on every American were being developed. But let me ask you, uh, ever since Donald Trump won the presidential election, there's been a drumbeat of attacks stating that Russia threw the election to Trump by hacking and releasing emails, by hiring internet trolls, by collecting blackmail material and other means. <coughs> These claims have come from political circles, intelligence circles, former British MI6 agent Christopher Steele and others. Let me ask you, Mr. Benny, what do you think about these claims? Did Russian hackers elect Donald Trump? Uh, <clears throat> I, I wrote an article that was uh, published in Consortium News on the 12th of December of last year. It said that this was all a big uh, uh, fabrication, uh, simply because they weren't saying exactly uh, where the hack came from and where the data out of the hack went to. I mean, that's the whole point of what NSA has set up in terms of copying and collecting everything in a fiber network inside the United States and virtually everything in the world on those fibers. So, I mean, that means that, and they've got trace route programs, hundreds by the hundreds scattered all over the world. That means that they can follow the packets as they move through the network. Now, if, <clears throat> if somebody hacks into the DNC or Hillary or Podesta's email or something, and they want to find out who it is, all they have to do is use the IP address with the X key score, as, as Edward Snowden said, and they've got all the data to find out where the packets went. But they haven't done that, you see. And even NSA, who's the only one that can do this, the rest of them are meaningless. If NSA says they've got data on it, then it's meaningful. If the rest say that this is, this is a, we have high confidence, that's just pure speculation. And it's something that's pure, it's just pure garbage. That doesn't mean anything. Produce the evidence, they haven't produced any at all. So. So that's what I called it back in December of last year. More recently, about a little over a month ago, you co-authored an article with Ray McGovern in which you wrote about Trump's response to this, that, quote, his choice may decide whether there is a future for this constitutional republic. Either Trump can acquiesce to or fight against a deep state of intelligence officials who have a myriad of ways to spy on politicians and other citizens and thus amass derogatory material that can be easily transformed into blackmail. That's a strong claim. Tell us, how do you see the Trump response to this attack on elected governments, and what should ordinary people do to prevent such a policy coup? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, President Trump realizes what's been going on. A recent statement he made about uh, uh, there's an awful lot of spying going on on U.S. citizens, and we, we really don't know the extent of it, and we really have to find out what the heck is – he used the word hell – what the hell is going on. Well, <clears throat> that means they're even keeping him in the dark. Now, as the president of the United States, he's supposed to know all the sources of information that are, uh, the intelligence community is using to produce intelligence for him, and he obviously doesn't know about this. But, I mean, I have made, made it perfectly clear that the Fairview program, Storm Brew programs, and, uh, and uh, Blarney programs for the tapping of fiber networks inside the United States are their sources of information on everybody in the United States, including representatives in the House and Senate, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> uh, even uh, uh, judges on the Supreme Court, uh, generals on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, all federal judges, all – all senior lawyer firms all around, and all journalists and everything, all of that stuff is being captured and stored. And what they're not talking about is they said, well, I've seen some arguments where they said, well, as long as we're only using it for intelligence and law enforcement isn't involved, uh, you know, it's okay for us to do that. That was the argument that I think Judge Napolitano put forward uh, <clears throat> that they were using with the FISA court to dupe them into doing what they want. And that's really what's happened. They've been duped, and so have the Congress. Most of Congress, I mean, the intelligence committees, I think, were more aware of what was going on than the rest of Congress. But they duped the rest of Congress. They made them all uh, just play along like a, a bunch of sheep. Here's the bell. Follow the bell, you know. So uh, our democracy basically doesn't really exist the way it was originally intended. Uh, and and the law enforcement, FBI, DEA, and uh, 
and others in the in the law enforcement community have direct access into the NSA data. They've had it all along. Director Mueller of the FBI said he'd been using the Stellar Wind, which is the domestic spying data, hmm. on uh, on uh, since since uh, 2001. He'd been using that. So, and that's direct access through their technology data center in Quantico, Virginia, into the NSA databases, where they can look at all the content and metadata of everybody in the country, and they can retroactively research them anytime they want. And they're using it to uh, to uh, arrest uh, people of common crime inside the United States. So, I mean, this is a simply a destruction of the entire uh, judicial process in our country, and it's a, it's a fundamental violation of the constitutional rights, and they've scrapped the Constitution fundamentally. I mean, that's why I said when the uh, Iraqis were <clears throat> struggling to put together a constitution, I said, well, why don't we give them ours? We're not using it. You know, one specific example of that recently is Michael Flynn, who, you know, his conversations with the Russian diplomat were recorded, which, you know, that happens. But then the unmasking, it's been reported that this was done by Susan Rice, Obama's national security advisor. I mean, as you put it, this, this sounds just like what, what Hoover used the FBI to do, collecting blackmail material to exert political control. What what must be done to prevent such control, such blackmail potential, uh, through agents operating through the intelligence sector? What do we do about this? Well, I mean, uh, you have to have uh, <clears throat> some attorney general who will take action, <clears throat> excuse me, to stop this. I mean, <clears throat> this is uh, fundamentally un is a violation of the fundamentals of the Constitution and the, the Bill of Rights. And also violations of the existing law, and they've tried to, like the Intel, like the in 2008 when they passed a retroactive immunity for the telecommunications companies, that was because they were giving them access to the fiber lines and letting them take all the data off the fiber lines, and because they were also giving them all the data on all their customers. So it was a, it was a, a trying to retroactively give immunity to people for who are committing an unconstitutional act which is unconstitutional and therefore not a law, which means that, and that's why I'm supporting four separate attempts to uh, challenge that in federal court. <clears throat> uh, we're challenging them based on the constitutionality of what the NSA is collecting. And once that get challenge gets up and of course gets, re gets into the Supreme Court, it's obvious that it's unconstitutional. Any idiot can see that. And, and what that simply means is that once they declare it unconstitutional, their entire house of calls fall, cards falls. All those laws they tried to pass to protect people also fall because they're not mm -hmm. constitutional. You can't authorize an unconstitutional act with a law. That law is not a law because it doesn't, it doesn't conform to the Constitution. So <clears throat> these are the things I'm, I'm trying to do. <clears throat> I think uh, everybody could, uh, should challenge them at federal court. But also the political way to do it is you, you need to fire people on the intelligence committees because they're, they're advocates for this kind of crap. And they're also part, part and parcel of covering up the, what they're really doing uh, to the rest of Congress. And that, that, that's, that's, I think, where it needs to focus. You need to focus on them and also in the courts and get the courts to recognize what's really been going on. They're so afraid of doing anything when it comes to national security because it's such an unfamiliar topic to them. But the Constitution is not an unfamiliar topic. All they have to do is pay attention to that and rule based on that. That's the simple answer. On the international front of it, according to recent reports, some of the initial launching of these investigations into Trump were sparked by intelligence coming from the UK, uh, as was the totally deranged report from MI6 agent Christopher Steele, including those salacious claims about Trump's behavior. Uh, under the Five Eyes arrangement, a lot of intelligence sharing occurs between the NSA and, for example, the UK's GCHQ. Let me ask, is having a foreign nation with a unsavory and imperial history being so tightly tied to our intelligence services, is this a concern for you, or how do you see this, this international partnership? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> it's gotten a little, uh, a little uh, too involved in, in my view. Anyway, uh, uh, <clears throat> for example, other than uh, the law enforcement and now other intelligence agencies that uh, Obama had opened up the NSA data to, so they can all now go in and look at it. But other than that, <clears throat> the other people who have direct access into the NSA database are the Five Eyes countries. <clears throat> uh, GCHQ has had it since uh, 2007, at least. 
and uh, the others are were were following that uh, probably in 2008 or 9. So that means that they can go in directly into that database too. Uh, <clears throat> and when you do that, you see you can you can actually pick and put uh, in place and and uh, uh, select the kinds of information you want and ignore the rest. So in other words, if there's exculpatory data <clears throat> in there about the Trump uh, campaign uh, program or anybody involved in it, then <clears throat> they, they may simply be ignoring that and uh, only putting forward something that may indicate that they were involved or something like what might indicate the suspicion or something, you know. So it's a matter of selecting the data that you look at instead of looking at the whole set of information to try to get an overall picture. So that's, what's, that's one thing I don't trust them to do. First of all, they're even messing up their own country with their investigative powers bill, where they, at least they're openly admitting they're going after everything that everybody's doing on the web. And, and they're trying to get the companies that uh, the, and the um, internet service providers to provide them uh, and do a lot of work for them um, for uh, against everybody who's in, in the UK as well, <laughs> who are using the web and, and querying things on the web. They want them to create a, an internet connection record is what they call it. <clears throat> so uh, for, <clears throat> for uh, British citizens alone, they were estimating about 60 billion records, internet connection records per day for just British citizens alone. Uh, but they've got a large uh, access to uh, the, the uh, transoceanic cables uh, going from uh, Europe to uh, America through Butte and uh, a couple other places too. So that, uh, <clears throat> that gives them uh, a lot more than that. I mean, the British part of it is just uh, bad enough, but uh, for them, and, but it's also uh, they're getting all the records on uh, U.S. citizens that, that are routed through any of the access points that they've got. So I think it's really uh, uh, kind of a, a situation that leads some, some effective monitoring. The oversight we have now with the FISA court and the intelligence committees is a farce. It's a, it's a joke. They don't do anything. They, haven't, they can't achieve anything. They, they don't know and they can't verify anything they're being told by the intelligence uh, agencies. So it's, a, it's really a sham. It's a charade. This might be asking me to speculate, but you had mentioned how there's the potential for spying on. You mentioned federal officials, judges, you know, top-level political layers inside the United States. The intelligence committees themselves, I would imagine, would be a prime target for this sort of compromising type of control. Do you think that that's a factor in the cowardice being shown by the intelligence committees? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I, I think that's part of it because uh, even when uh, Senator Schumer warned uh, President Trump that he shouldn't go after the intelligence community because they've got many ways to get back at him. Well, this is exactly one of them. OK, so <clears throat> what that's really saying is everything they've done electronically has also been captured and they can go back and look at everything they're doing and everything they've ever done for uh, at least the last 10 years, 10, 15 years anyway. So I, 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 yeah, that's uh, that's definitely it. I mean, I, we have a another whistleblower, Russell Tice, who had, who had uh, made it perfectly clear that this is the kind of activity that was going on. He even said that in in some of the areas that he was, they where he saw this data, he saw the transcripts of phone calls of the then Senator Obama. <clears throat> I've been calling it the uh, the uh, Imperial Guard or the, uh, you know, for the like for the Roman Empire the. the their their uh, their, their uh, imperial guard basically determined who the emperor was and what they did. So that's what's happening here with the intelligence community. Was there a you know if there was a lot of pushback or a fight around the five eyes sharing around giving access to such sensitive material to foreign governments? Uh, <clears throat> I didn't hear anything. I've never heard any any uh, opposition to that at all. I mean because. Fundamentally, the Five Eyes are the ones that are, <clears throat> that are doing this worldwide bulk data acquisition. They're the core of it. There are about eight other countries around the world, uh, eight or nine, that are also participating, uh, and they've got limited access to that data. So, uh, but the core is the Five Eyes, and I'm, I believe they've got, <clears throat> they've got almost unfettered access to it. You had mentioned that you're pursuing lawsuits as a way of challenging these activities through the federal courts. How are those, how are those proceeding? 
Uh, well, they're still going, but I mean, the government's trying to slow roll them because they know that uh, when it comes to the Constitution and uh, uh, and what they are doing, that they are uh, they are actively uh, performing unconstitutional activities, and they don't want it exposed in federal court and the public uh, because all of those activities uh, are fundamentally uh, impeachable offenses. And also, I mean, that's uh, that's what we impeached uh, Richard Nixon for. Violation of constitutional rights of U.S. citizens. That's exactly what's going on now. Except it's go, it's involving everybody. Back then, Nixon couldn't only handle a few thousand people. You know, with the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA, those are the same three doing it now. I mean, you had the, the CIA return. break in break into the Senate uh, when they were writing the, that summary paper about the tro- torture. The, you had the torture, them yeah. break into their you had them break into their servers. They they got caught at it anyway. And then didn't exactly receive much punishment for such a brazen mm-hmm. act. Nothing well, really what happened. can you do when people have the goods on you? You know exactly. Who, yeah. What, what, well, who's going to do anything against them? Right. Well, it seems like this is something that people have to be aware of. That you know, understanding the potential of the use of blackmail and through the agencies that are collecting the material on it, that makes it possible, I suppose, to sort of inoculate or immunize against the effects of being able to pull out a scandal on demand uh, if you if people are aware that that's used as a political technique and and that's its origins. Oh yeah, um, and they use it internationally too. It's not just in the United States. I mean, they use this kind right. of power against mm-hmm. them, Jim Rosen, the Associated Press, other reporters, mm-hmm. right, the Tea Party, um the uh, Occupy group, you know, anybody who's doing something that they don't particularly care for, they go after and try to get rid of them like General Petraeus and General Allen and also uh, Elliot Spitzer, of course. They went after him. He was going mm-hmm. after the bankers for defrauding people. Well, right. uh, the problem is that the, 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 the way the banks were packaging the deals, they had to, they were forced by Congress to, to, um, uh, to approve loans that couldn't be um, supported by people getting them. So that, that made it a bad, a bad investment, so they had to package it. And then they sold these packages around the world, <clears throat> and that's that was and they and they fraudulently, um, uh, you know, advertised them. So that's what uh, Elliot Spitzer was going after them for for fraudulently soliciting uh, uh, people to buy these packaged uh, deals, and and they had to stop that because it would lead back to the to the Congress of the United States. That would expose them, so you have to stop it, you know. And so they got rid of Elliot. I mean, what was the probable cause for anybody to investigate Elliot Spitzer? I can't think of one, except that, oh, he's going after our bankers. Well, let me ask you, in the uh, in the aftermath of the revelations of the, the spying on King, you know, there was the church committee, there was the efforts of Congressman Neil Gallagher, and there was, I think this is when the um, intelligence communities uh, committees were created, was that an effective pushback at the time? What would, would something like that look like today? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> I think fundamentally we need another church committee uh, that's public, open to the public all the way, that isn't hidden, no closed sessions at all, it, we, especially when it comes to exposing violations of our constitutional rights and, uh, and the rights of people, period. So uh, I think that this needs to be out in the open, and those who are doing it should be held accountable in the open. And if we can, if if it comes to uh, uh, you know, indicting them, I think that that's a proper way to do things. That they need to be indicted, uh, and uh, you know the law should be uh, adhered to. In my view, anyway. One more, I suppose, technical question before a summary. At the opening, you had discussed how if Russian hackers had really gotten these emails and released them, the NSA would have been able to find out about that, given that the NSA sees all of the Internet traffic. Uh, some people say, well, Tor, however, is something that the NSA isn't able to unravel completely. Would that have provided a potential technical means to make it possible to hide the, the tracks of moving the data around? No, I think they could have at least gotten parts of the some of the packets. I mean that's one of the reasons they put all the trace route programs in hundreds of hundreds of switches around the uh, the internet around the world. That's because uh, that's because they are uh, tracing all the packet routes to try to reconstruct Tor. That was one of the purposes for it. 
Is there anything else that uh, you'd like to you'd like to say to our listeners? The law enforcement use of this data is just outright uh, disgraceful. And uh, I would also point out that Comey has known about all of this material and the use of it since at least the hospital visit in 2004 to Ashcroft when, when he was in the hospital. And uh, Comey mm-hmm. was acting uh, attorney general. And he, right. he at that point uh, refused to renew the uh, program. He's known about it since then. All this business about saying, well, you know, the Trump Tower, we, was never, there was no wiretap directed at the Trump Tower. That's correct. You know, wiretapping basically is uh, obsolete. That word is obsolete. Everything now is surveillance, and it's constant surveillance of everything. So all of that data is captured and stored. And so it, it, it's not a question of wiretapping anymore. It's a question of targeting in the known in the database that's been captured. So if somebody wants to go after uh, uh, the then candidate Trump, they'd have to go into that database with his signatures and go after the data, all the data about him. That's targeting once you've captured the data. See, wiretap is to get the data and capture it. So this constant surveillance gets all that data anyway. I see. So there's no, there'd be, of so, course, so no need to have specific wiretapping of Trump since everything's already That's right. Collected. That's correct. Yeah, that's right. And, and so it's a word game. Everything's a word game with these people now in the public. And pub, the public's being duped by this word game. That's all. And unless you know the ins and outs of what they do and how they do it, you know, you, you know, you think it sounds reasonable. The uh, the wall between there used to be, at least people were you know generally taught or given the impression that there was an absolute wall between intelligence gathering and then criminal prosecutions, which allowed a much lower bar for uh, wiretap surveillance, et cetera, for national intelligence purposes. It seems like from what you've been saying that that barrier has been almost entirely eliminated. Is that is that true? Yes, that's right. At, since 2001, according to Director Mueller. Yeah, he, he made that statement to uh, uh, Bart Gelman when he, when Bart did an interview of him in um, 2011 for Time magazine. Uh, that's also on the web, and you can go. Uh, the way he put it was, we had been using the Stellar Wind program since 2001. Now, you have to know what the Stellar Wind program is. That's the domestic spying data, the content and metadata of domestic spying. That's from the Fairview, Stormbrew, Blarney programs, where hundreds of, at least over 100 caps inside the United States collecting all this data off the fiber network. Wow. Now, you had proposed a different method of, of collection entirely that you believe would have made it possible to safeguard uh, privacy. And your program but also is not and adopted. succeed and succeed at mm. stopping terrorism. Not 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 <clears throat> see because now what they have is uh, too much data altogether. They can't get through it in time to assess threats, so they can't stop the threat. So people get killed, right? Then they go clean up the mess, right? And then they go after mm. the people that they knew did it because they've got lots of data already stored on them, right? And so from there on, it's like a forensics. They become a, intelligence has become a forensics job, a police job after the fact, after the crime. When in fact, intelligence, the purpose of intelligence is to predict intentions and capabilities of adversaries in advance so you can do something to stop it. And they've lost that entire perspective. So we're paying tens of billions of dollars to, to capture everything uh, <clears throat> every year, by the way. And uh, and actually not be able to use it or do anything with it. So that's that's the big uh, uh, that's the big swindle that uh, we're all under now. It's uh, we're doing this collection of everything for terrorism, and yet you can't do a thing to stop it because of all you've collected. And so when a terrorist attack happens, they say we need more data, more money, and more people. That's a building an empire at the expense of the few people who have to die now and then to keep the program going. Do you, do you see this as a uh, as a funding or like a, an allocation of resources issue, or also as a do you see it also as a methodology problem in terms of the approach that analysts are taking to the use of data that we do have? Uh, it's it's basically a combination of all of that. Uh, <clears throat> but fundamentally, the motivation for these agencies is to swindle the public out of money, to build a bigger empire and <clears throat> intelligence empire, contracting empire. And, you know, a governmental empire. 
like it takes a lot of people to do all of this uh, collection and a lot of contracts and a lot of contractors uh, to be involved to make it happen. So that's that's an empire you build, and it costs a lot of money to do it. I mean, I, I reckon they're spending over $100 billion a year on the intelligence community, all 17 agencies of it now. Whereas, you know, they, if, if President Trump wants to build a wall, he, he could take a $2 billion out of the CIA and $2 billion out of the NSA uh, program every year, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't miss it. They wouldn't, it wouldn't affect them at all. I mean, they couldn't do any better than they're doing right now anyway. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's um, touched on a lot of, a lot of topics here. I guess I can just ask again, is, is there anything else you'd like to add to conclude? Uh, no, I, <clears throat> except the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the law enforcement use of this data is corrupting our entire judicial process. I mean, it's really saying, it's really making a sham of it because, you know, uh, even I, I would add one, one case, Amnesty International versus Clapper, that made it all the way to the Supreme Court. When the, uh, when the uh, Solicitor General of the United States arguing the case to the government against the, uh, against the, uh, uh, the the uh, amnesty ch challenge, which was that uh, they were using data to criminally convict people without telling them the source of it, so they could challenge under the discovery rules mm. and their right as 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 a, as a constitutional right in a court of law to challenge any of the discovery of material used against them in a court of law. Well, you see, they they couldn't confess openly that it all came from NSA because all that data was acquired without a warrant. That meant it would all be thrown out. That meant the government would have no case. So you see, they had to they had to do these parallel constructions, create the data, and use that as a substitute for the NSA data in the court of law. Well, it's a violation of all the principles of the constitutional rights of citizens, you know. And it really makes a right. sham of our entire uh, judicial process. I mean, this is this is uh, we're we're actually watching our democracy go right down the drain here. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. This is certainly a very sobering assessment. I think it's a good kick in the pan for people who aren't aware of this and uh, provided some opportunities, some avenues, what, what can be done about it. So, uh, yeah. so, Benny, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.